welcome to a brand new episode of Gadget Nation with me, Adam Carruthers. And you know what? I'm back here at Publica. Very happy to be back here. It was just with some friends. Now I'm talking to you. Today's episode, really cool app and one of the most anticipated games of the year will all be shown. Gadget Nation starts now. Every now and then, something comes along which completely changes the way you use the internet, or perhaps something associated with the internet, like a smartphone, for example. Also, sometimes, something comes along and it completely changes the way we access our news. Think of Twitter and the effect of people tweeting and how you get your news from that. Now, there's a new app out called Sumly, which aims to do the same thing for you and your news. Let's find out what it's all about. time is it? There's never enough time, is there? There's never enough time to actually do what you want to do. So nowadays, everything comes in little small doses. That's exactly what I'm going to show you right now with an app called Summly. Now, why do I talk about time? Okay, supposing there's a whole bunch of articles you want to read. A lot of the time, you can actually save it for later and when you're alone, you can read it. But half the time, I forget. I keep mentioning the word time because this is a time saver. Summly will summarize all your summaries. As simple as that. I know it sounds confusing. Let me talk you through it. What it does is, it's an application which will access lots and lots of websites and it's based on categories. Now you can also add keywords you like, because I'm really stupid, I added a category Brad Pitt. Don't ask me why. But what it'll do is, it will go and it'll source for all of the news it can and it uses an algorithm to search for it specifically. Now what's really cool is, it will draw up an article based on um, the category or your chosen word and it'll put it into 400 characters on the screen for you. Now of course, you have the option of expanding it, but you just get a top line view of exactly what you need. Okay, so this app, I have to tell you, is absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's very reminiscent of a Windows mobile device in terms of the colors and the tile-based icons, as you can see right there, albeit it's much more stretched out. Not so much of a box, but more of a rectangle. I'm so smart. But anyhow, let's go straight into it. Um, for example, if I go into Entertainment and Arts, so it has some news there, as you can see. Now this one is all about gestures. It really, really is key, and it's very smooth and intuitive. For example, swipe across like that, very fast, as you can see, swiping across. Now if you scroll up, it will go back to there. Now if I open up where I was just now, if I scroll down, it will actually expand into the entire article. So that itself is pretty nifty, if you ask me. And my connection is a bit slow, so it's taking a little while to load, but you get the general gist of it. So if I open up another category, of course, it will work. Well, I'll go to the same one. I just want to show you this. Social networking. It's all about social networking. If you hold it down, it allows you to share Facebook, Twitter, and you can also message it just like that. Very intuitive, very smooth, very cool. In closing, what do I think about this? What sets it apart above everything else is the algorithm. Now, a lot of people have tried to create basically a news aggregator, but this one works well. Uh, put in whatever keywords you want. It already has various topics, fashion and style, entertainment and arts, Wall Street Journal, business, etc., etc. Also, I have to say, the interface. Absolutely beautiful. Even when I'm looking at one 
article right here. It still looks very nice, it tells me where the news source is from, and you can also expand it like I said early on. Now that really sets it apart. If you're constantly on the go, if you never have any time to sit down at your computer like that and start browsing all sorts of articles, this could very well be the solution for you. It allows you to expand on the really important articles you want, but also have a top line view of all the other stuff that you might miss in the future. Pretty nifty, do check it out. On the show today, we have someone really cool, Paul Lewis from The Guardian UK. Now in 2010, he won the Journalist of the Year at the uh, British Press Awards. Now, what he's gonna talk about today is the power of social media and crowdsourcing in journalism. Let's hear what he has to say. Well, I think it's quite a complex question. You know, investigative journalism, there is no completely agreed term or definition, but I quite like the idea that it's you know trying to find out something that someone doesn't want you to know. So you're finding information which isn't instantly available. You know, there are arguments that, and they're quite valid arguments, that because of the market problems and decline in revenues for print newspapers in the UK, Europe and the US, there's less money for investigative journalism. The truth is that you know, while that is the case, I think the digital era is leading to a transformation in the way in which people do investigative reporting, and more importantly, the people who are doing it, who have the tools to do it and the skills and the knowledge. And increasingly, we're seeing that it's not just paid journalists who are doing that, but other people are doing it as well. Well, from the technology perspective, I was using a BlackBerry which are very good reporting tools for a number of reasons. Firstly, far better for typing than, than iPhones. Um, the battery lasts longer, which is crucial. If you're in a riot situation, you know, um, night after night, continually through the night, you're having to work with no access to somewhere to recharge your phone. It's a really good battery. And of course, you can use it for emailing, video, pictures, tweeting, which is the first form of uh, publication, um, and taking notes as well. So really, you, the entire package, if you like, is just in that, in that one phone. And I was using it um, both to kind of convey what I was seeing, but also to communicate with lots of other people who, particularly through Twitter, were helping inform my decisions about how to report and where to go, telling me when I made mistakes, giving me advice and guidance. Yeah, it depends. I mean, now we have iPhones, um, which are better for video and better for uploading. And we would just upload to a, to a usually just to a kind of private YouTube account. Um, and pictures can be emailed. Yeah, there's a, there is trolling, um, but there was such a high quantity of feedback that they kind of get lost in the, in the chorus of people who actually really want to help. You know, and it was an immense help. I mean, I remember lots of occasions when I was in a, you know, stuck, not sure where to go. And if I'd been a journalist covering um, riots in the UK in the decades earlier, or the LA riots in, in, in the US, you know, I would have had to chase plumes of smoke or chase ambulances um, to find out where the trouble was. And with this mechanism, I could just tweet, you know, where, you know, where is the trouble in, say, you know, the North London Borough of Hackney or, or Tottenham? And I would instantly get advice on where to go, and I can just plug that into my phone, into the map, and it tells me, what, it tells me where to go. And usually that was quite reliable. So on the whole, there were occasions when people were not helpful and joked around and, you know, told me they didn't like what I was doing. But 
for the large part, I think people were appreciative. You know, they, there, was a, there was a lack of information, as there often is in crises, in you know, big rolling news events. Is, uh, people thirst for information, and anyone who can provide them that, I think, uh, uh, provide a useful service, and people were grateful for that. Well, I might, I might be wrong on this, but my sense is that mobile phone penetration is pretty high everywhere. I mean, even in the least developed countries. And most mobile phones have got some recording device on them. So that's a game changer. It doesn't really matter that, you know, say that, that people have le less access to, to, to Facebook or Twitter. I mean, it matters in terms of the speed in which the information comes out. But the crucial part is that it's recorded. And if you look at any conflict around the world right now, anywhere in the world, that conflict is being recorded. Big things that happen, controversial things that happen, it becomes an instinct now for people to take their phone out of their pocket and record what they see. Now, for if you're a journalist who works in the sphere of you know, finding evidence, then that's brilliant. You know, it's something we've never had before. We would have had to have the good fortune of having a camera person or a photographer in the vicinity, serendipity. And instead now we have pretty much, you know, for big events, blanket recording by citizens who, if we play our cards right, we can work in a collaborative way to get the story out with. I think the key is just to recognise how profoundly the industry is changing. And my sense is that in Asia, because newsprint circulation is staying quite high, it's quite robust, and because we're not seeing the decline in revenues, which we're seeing in, in the US and Europe, maybe there's a feeling that things aren't changing so much, but I think actually the digital era has really transformed our industry. You know, it, it, our job is nothing like it would have been for a previous generation and it's still going to change a huge amount more. So I think the more agile we can be, the more responsive to change, probably the better for our careers is, is my view. Brief history of the Xbox. When the first one came out, not the 360, the one before that, the original Xbox, one of the games that really sold it was Halo and it changed the way we use multiplayer forever with Xbox Live, etc. Of course, Halo 2 came out and the Xbox 360 saw various incarnations like Halo 3, ODST and Reach. Now, Bungie has left the scene officially. They are the guys that developed the original Halo series and newcomers have come in with Halo 4. How do they stack up? Avery decided to find out. I was put into service eight years ago. AI's deteriorating after seven. Hey, I'm Avery Score. This is Cameron Gray, who has been specially deputized to aid me in this review of Halo 4, a game that many of you are probably already playing, and some of you are eagerly anticipating playing. Uh, anyway, this time around, once again, you reprise your role as John 117, the Master Chief, aided by Cortana. Cortana is has gone a little crazy, I think it's fair to say. She's gone rampant, so normally this has just been introduced as a fact, I wasn't aware of it, but AI started to deteriorate after seven years, and Cortana is eight years old, making her completely over the hill in AI terms, right? And so gradually the information that stores her huge artificial intelligence brain is eating away at her, which is perhaps even more interesting than the main plot itself. Cortana. I was put into service eight years ago. Eight years. AIs deteriorate after seven, Chief. 
Uh, the main plot is you're trying to take back one of the four runners, the Didact, whom you've encountered before. A uh, little bit like Dido, except fewer solos with Eminem, and a greater desire to kill you. Uh, I won't give too much away about the plot for those who uh, are really hardcore fans and read all the novelizations and everything, but uh, yeah, Cameron, did you uh, enjoy this title? Halo 4 was an excellent game. I mean, I've been playing Halo for many, many years now from the original Xbox to now the Xbox 360. Now, what's really great about this Halo 4 game is you finally get to find out where Cortana has come from and what her real position is in the gameplay. And I, I really enjoyed that. I don't know if I'm allowed to go away any spoilers here. I had a great time playing with you, despite your uh, tendency to turn uh, a game that looks like Logan's Run into Bogan's Run with your Leroy Jenkins running and gunning action. Uh, but I do feel that the combat has not evolved. You see what I did there? Yeah, uh, yeah. Very much very since the first game. In fact, it's devolved in certain aspects. I want to dual wield stuff all the time. Pretty much want to dual wield everything. I want to dual wield pelicans. I want like to have a pelican here, a pelican here, and just concentrate fire on a single dude. And saying that there was a downfall, the Pelicans uh, being, there's only one person that can really shoot, the, the side yeah. uh, gunners can't yeah. really do anything. I was completely screwed throughout much of that that little bit of gameplay that we just had. That I'm sure you were having a great time. It was, I was excellent, pretty, yeah. I was pretty much hanging on the side, you know, it was kind of like the Full Metal Jacket thing. If we'd had the Full Metal Jacket music, it probably would add a lot of dimension. True to form, as you expect from the Halo game, there are a lot of great vehicular sequences and set pieces that have a lot of meat that you can sink your teeth into. One such passage for me was when we were in that just ridiculously huge tank in the desert. You know, it's the desert because, you know, I felt kind of parched around the lips, my hair was frizzing, but I was having a great time. We had a huge stockade of weapons in there, and Cameron and I would make these forays out, you know, pick up a few guys, come up with a strategy, sort of zoom around the same rock with multiple ghosts, high five on the way, and just sort of go in guns blazing. Uh, and that's, to me, ha Halo at its best when you're able to just really get in the thick of the action and enjoy a moment with a buddy. However, I wouldn't go so far as to bring the game online because I hate people I don't know. I hate most of the people that I do know. So Cameron feels differently. The online multiplayer is absolutely excellent. First of all, uh, Halo's now brought out loadouts, similar to what you'll find in Call of Duty. You can pick your uh, main weapon, your secondary weapon, uh, some, something like a jetpack or a shield plus a couple of other perks, whether you want to have unlimited running or just reload faster, and it's absolutely excellent. Uh, going with that and having a headset, yelling at all your friends and trying to, you know, get the flag first or whatnot, it is just absolutely brilliant gameplay. And saying that, it takes a little bit to get used to because generally, uh, you know, you're not really used to loadout sequence in, in Halo. That's more of a, like I say, Call of Duty thing. thing. Yeah. Plus, I have unlimited running in real life. That's a real thing. I can, I can just run forever. But that's a good thing about Halo is that you can play it any way you want. There's so much, so many possible ways to play this game and to enjoy it. Whether you enjoy the co-op, the online multiplayer, you can even waste time in the forge. That there's really something for everyone, I would say, in Halo game. Now what's really about good about this game is that every few weeks or so, they're actually bringing out new campaign missions. That's right? great. So as long as you've got your live account, which does cost a little bit, every few weeks you're getting new campaign missions, which is, is something new for everyone. So, um, so I mean, just start entering random numbers and letters on your the live account sign up page and see if you get lucky. That's exactly right. Maybe yeah. you get an Xbox Live subscription. Maybe you get a free holiday. I don't know. It could happen. <laughs> could be you. But anyway, I was rather recalcitrant to play yet another Halo title. I've played every single one, and over the years my interest has waned, but I will say that the quality of the experience that we had really did sort of spike things up again for me. That said, in terms of the presentation, I will say that even you, Cameron, would have to admit that the graphics engine is knocking on a little bit at this point. It is getting a bit old. I mean, they've done a lot of work on Master Chief and his armor, but comparing it to a lot of other late games at the moment, it's not really getting there, which is a shame. No, I mean, if you put that side by side with other, you know, first business, well, with Crisis, yeah, no comparison. With a Far Cry, no comparison. Uh, it does have these cool sort of stylized visuals, but again, it's very Tron-like. There's sort of these beams of light through most of the levels. Uh, you do have some outdoor levels, which I think are much more successful ultimately. But in terms of a graphical and presentation standpoint, it really can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the more modern shooters. That said, it does have its own visual style. The cutscenes look great, and even though the characters are comparably low poly, they are expressive and you do care about them, especially Cortana as she goes, you know, slowly, completely nuts. So it, it is engaging despite the low quality of the visuals. 
I don't know, I would say all in all, this is a very strong entry in the Halo franchise. This does, as Cameron was saying, give you a, a huge more amount of background on Cortana, who's someone who's followed you throughout your missions. Uh, and all in all, the, probably the only thing that you really had to hear about this is that the new Halo out! Ah! I could have just done that and we could have been running to the store for the rest of the episodes. But. That would have been good fun. Yeah, it would have. Well, Cameron, thank you for coming on the show and thank you for helping me out with your expertise on the no online. Problem. It's cool. And go grab Halo. See you next week. Marking. Impact predicted 77.8 kilometers due north. You know where it's heading. Same place we are. Ooh, Halo 4, you've got me excited, Avery. I can't wait to crack it open and give it a shot because I loved all the other Halos. This one looks just as good. Anyhow, that's the end of the episode. I want to give a big shout out once again to Publica for hosting us here today. It's been really, really awesome, I have to say. Find us on Facebook or Twitter. My name is Adam Carruthers. Until next time. Gadget Nation contest is back! We have two units of Aces Patfun with Patfun Station to give away. There will be two rounds of questions this week and the next. The questions for this week are Name us one of the products featured in Gamer Station in Season 7 Episode 10. The episode first broadcast on October 5th, 2012. Second question Name us three products that Gadget Nation featured in Season 7, started from August 3rd, 2012 to November 9th, 2012. Answer all two rounds of questions and complete the slogan, I am a fan of the Asus Pad Phone because... in not more than 25 words. Send in your entries to gngadget at astro.com.my before 11.59pm on December 20th, 2012. Terms and conditions apply.